if the train stops running for Fortnite, then they've got to pick up the phone all of a sudden and call all their partners and say, hey, do you want to do a league? Hey, do you want to... And, and they've, to some degree, they've alienated all of that. And I think that's just, I just have a different opinion on whether that leads to success. The startup investment landscape is changing and world-class companies are being built outside of Silicon Valley. We find them, talk with them, and discuss the upside of investing in them. Welcome to Upside. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Upside Podcast, the first podcast finding upside outside of Silicon Valley. I'm Jay Klaus, and I'm accompanied by my co-host, Mr. Mouse and Keyboard himself, Eric Hornung. So my brother is a streamer. He's a gamer, Jay. Which one? Alex. Really? Yeah, he does it every single day for somewhere between 6 and 12 hours. What? He is very, very good at Fortnite and Call of Duty. Are people watching this? Yeah, people are watching it on Twitch. Six to 12 hours? Yeah, it's a lot. You can go check him out. His handle is It's Nungs, N-U-N-G-Z. Is he getting paid? I think he makes some money, yeah. He has to make some money somewhere. Yeah. Six to 12 hours? It's a lot of, it's a lot of time, yeah. But I was home over Christmas, and I've always wanted to learn how to play mouse and keyboard. Because... I don't know if you're familiar since I gave you this nickname because you can't, you're so uncreative, you couldn't come up with something yeah, yourself. You were just impatient. I could have come up with something. <laughs> In the world of gaming, there is your console gaming, which is your Xbox, your PS5 now. We're on PS5. That's kind of crazy. But there's also what more intense gamers play, which is mouse and keyboard, which is a lot harder to move. And it's just like you think you aim with your mouse, you move with your keyboard. Not super intuitive, not super easy, but I learned. I grew up in that world. That's what Medal of Honor was like. Oh, really? Yeah. So you do know? Yeah, I grew up in that world. Wow. We used to have the communication platforms were so nascent back in the day. It was called TeamSpeak, followed by Ventrilo. And if I remember, to link to it or tweet it out in the show notes, I can tweet out a photo of Christmas when I was 12-ish years old, when I got my first external microphone for the computer. Not a great look for me, but yeah, it used to be all cobbled together and it was all mouse and keyboard and dial-up. And now we just have external microphones for podcasts and no internet here at CES. That's right. Strange regression, but much better microphone. Holy cow, is this a lot better of a microphone. But speaking of gaming, today we're speaking to James O'Connor, the co-founder and president of the Pittsburgh Knights. James has been globally recognized as one of the best team builders and strategists in all of esports. He is the president of the Pittsburgh Knights, a global esports team of 30 plus players and streamers. In 2018, the Knights announced their partnership with a six time Super Bowl champion, Pittsburgh Steelers. And in 2019, the Knights brought on another strategic partner with Pittsburgh Roots, Wiz Khalifa. Wiz Khalifa, Eric. I was such a big Wiz Khalifa fan in college. Now, I thought Wiz Khalifa had a song about green and yellow. No, he did black and yellow. Black and yellow. Lil Wayne remixed it to green and yellow. For the Packers. Packers. And my friend Shane Darrow, who you know from fantasy football, remixed it to a song called White and Forest, which was played all over OU for a few years. Oh, wow. Was it good? No. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) But it was good enough. Well, we've started to dip our toes into esports and gaming over the last year. If you haven't listened to our episode with Josh Chapman of Convoy Ventures, I highly recommend that. We've spoken with Matt Benson of eFuse, who's building an infrastructure startup for esports and gaming. And today, we're finally dipping into the world of professional esports on the team side. And we couldn't have a better guest than James O'Connor, the co-founder and president of the Knights themselves. So if you guys are into this episode or want to connect with us, you can send us a tweet at UpsideFM. Connect with us on Instagram at the same handle or... Flip us an email if you got something a little longer. Hello at upside.fm. Get into the game. Jay, come with me on a quest. Come with me on an adventure. Are you in? I'm in. All right. I want you to start a high growth startup right now. What's its name? The Haberdashery. The Haberdashery. It's a very traditional startup name. Google, Zenga, the Haberdashery. All right. Tip of the hat to that name. That's a, yeah, that's, that's a nice one. So let's say that you go out and you want to hire some great engineering talent to get this thing off the ground. 
are you going to do? Where are you going to go? Well, I would probably first go to my own network and realize quickly that I don't know enough engineers. Right. And with a name like the Haberdashery, you're going to have a tough time recruiting. Tough time. Tough time. I might need some outside help, Eric. Yeah. I think if I were you, I would go to our friends over at Integrity Power Search. I mean, they're the number one full stack, high growth startup recruiting firm between the coasts. They partner with venture capitalists, private equity groups, and hypothetical CEOs like you, Jay, to build amazing teams for the world's most disruptive companies. Since 2012, they've successfully executed over 600 searches, so that sounds like you're starting engineers, Jay? We could get those, all right? We can get those with IPS. And they are on track for over 200 in 2019. Their clients have collectively raised over 2.5 billion with a B in venture funding, and hey, maybe with the haberdashery, they'll be counting. If they can help the haberdashery, they can help you. Learn more about Integrity Power Search at upside.fm slash integrity and they may just be able to help you find your first engineers. James, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you very much for having me. So on Upside, we'd like to start with the background of the guests, but we're actually going to change it up a little bit today. Can you tell us about the history of the Pittsburgh Knights? Okay. Uh, We founded the company in December 1st of 2017. A small hole in the wall and... uh, downtown Pittsburgh with the whole goal of creating strategic partnerships in a unique ownership group. And I think that we've done that as a founding group. And so I wanted to put together music, sports, sports partners, and esports and gaming. And so we did that. A wholly owned subsidiary of the Steelers invested in our company as, a, as an initial investor. They provided a partnership agreement where they incubate us in their offices and they support us with a significant amount of experience and support. So I haven't heard a no, that which is a blessing. And we meet with all their employees, and they teach us about how they do business. And so what an amazing organization that we could learn from. And so another sports team group invested as well. It's not public yet. And Wiz Khalifa also partnered as well. And so we brought him and Taylor Gang around us to support us in our growth over the next couple of years. They're investors and partners of ours. And uh, so we, we think we can do a lot of cool things together. Why was music as important as a potential investor? If you think about gaming, gaming is entertainment. And I wanted to do something innovative in my business school, my MBA program. I learned about innovation is putting things that don't normally that haven't really gone together significantly in a different space. So you see entertainers come to esports events, but you don't really see them heavily engaged. And so it was about putting Pittsburgh first when we created the ownership group. It's all Pittsburgh-based groups. And so music was a way to basically, there's a, that's a good question, but there's a lot of, there's so many answers to that, but I'll try my best to, music is really a part of gaming. And I wanted to take the best of the music industry and the knowledge of that and apply it to our company. So even the way that music monetizes has a direct correlation to how esports needs to monetize. LeBron says that all rappers want to be ballers and all ballers want to be rappers. Is there a similar parallel somewhere in gaming and music? I think everybody plays games from casual to competitive. So I think it's a unifying thing that everybody comes together. So sports, so if you think about it, an NFL player, he might want to be an artist, a music artist. If you think about a music artist, they might want to be a sports player. I I agree with that. But the unifying thing in all of that is they probably all played games growing up. So it's a pretty cool medium to have all the people come together around it. You said that you started this team with the goal of having strategic partnerships and unique ownership. What is the non-unique model of ownership in esports right now? So a lot of people, I've been in the esports industry for close to 20 years, three years off when I I took a break and then Twitch blew up the industry and I had to come back. (laughs) Uh, I left in 2012, right? And I, I refused to turn the computer on. But to answer your question, actually, can you repeat it, please? You said that you wanted to start this team with a unique ownership structure. Oh, VC, VC. So there's a, there's not too many people that have been in the industry as long as I have. And so VC, when they find those groups, they really want access to the market. And so they're investing in those groups. And so it's not normal for sports groups to invest in esports properties. It's just starting to happen now. Why start a team versus starting 
an infrastructure play or something else in the esports space? We're doing both. The Knights aren't just a team. We're an event management company just starting. And so we have a partnership, a joint venture with the largest arcade in the world. It's called Replay FX. And it has uh, 20,000 people came to it last year. We're expecting about 25 to 27,000 this year, July 9th through 12th. And so it's a nonprofit partnership that we have where they own a significant amount of equipment. Basically, they go out and buy all our old arcade games. Everything that you've grown up, Dig Dug, Pac-Man, Pinball, everything from the 1970s till today, they own and they preserve and they restore and they host a large arcade four days out of the year. And so we're gonna be taking that and I'd like to turn the Steelers Stadium into a barcade. That'd be amazing. Yeah, we have uh, Stage AE, the ownership of the Steelers have asked me to get going with events. We wanted to build the infrastructure of the company first to be able to monetize the events through sponsorships and partnerships. So what's really special about the event to me is when parents are trying to understand what their kids are doing playing Fortnite or Call of Duty or Counter-Strike or Rocket League, Smash, they're, they're trying to figure out what's going on and they're disconnected. And a way that they can become reconnected is by coming to Replay FX and playing the game that they grew up with and sharing that experience with their kids and then playing and experiencing the new game in a casual setting. And we're also going to be doing esports competitions. So the goal is to turn it, replay effects into a kind of like a mini dream hack. And so if you think about that, when you asked why music, well, potentially one of the things Wiz is going to do with us is live appearances and promotional uh, tweets, engaging, driving traffic to events and letting people know where he's going to be. So we will basically at nine, nine o'clock at night, we're going to turn it into, you know, DJ and do some cool stuff. And we're going to be adding esports elements to it. So we have some great partners that are going to be coming in, building esports competition elements at the show. One thing that's unique about esports is that under the same brand, you can have different teams, right? So you have different people playing different games under the Pittsburgh Knights yep. team. How do you decide which games? That's a really good question. It's kind of the secret sauce, but I'll give you a, I'll give you a tip of it. Yeah, no one will hear this. Okay, no one. <laughs> so I'm trying to f- figure out what I want to share on this because um, some of it, I've, I've just, transparently, I just spent the last month of my life through Christmas figuring that question out to the science like to to like probably like 40 hours just in a room with a whiteboard doing the analytics but really what it is is how are you going to be able to monetize across the game I mean, it's a business so how are you how are you going to drive traffic how are you going to drive fandom and engagement the popularity of the game it, it's a marketing play for the game developers until it isn't so if you think about the way the game developers think they think, okay, I want to monetize the game, so first let's promote the game, like a publisher. And then they say, okay, let's engage the community by doing online tournaments or in-person live tournaments. And then from that, they start to see if there's a monetization of that through ticket sales or broadcasting or obviously concessions and then sponsorships. And so from that, they say, okay, is this as far as I want to go? Or is there a market to commercialize my game where I can sell a franchise out of it? And so they go through the whole cycle of that. And so we really try to understand the life cycle of where these games are. And you have to appreciate how you think their like their, their projections are going to be so you can make your own projections. So to be clear, I look at their live broadcast time. I look at their viewership I look at their social media engagement of their their social media accounts of what they're promoting the game. I want to know the investment that the game developer is putting into it. I want to know what they're helping, what their contribution and partnership to us is as a partner so that we can understand the revenue. So everything we do is based in, in just numbers. Excel spreadsheets. Help me explain the, the value chain here within the professional gaming arena. If you have the game developers, you have you as a team, you have players. How are players compensated? How are you compensated as a team? Like, how do the economics of that all work out? So this really blew up in about 2016. So if you just want to look at League of Legends and how they started doing it, that's where all of a lot of the esports teams are really based off of. And it's just from one simple thing, a game becoming extremely popular, which is League of Legends, and them doing publisher stipends. So they're paying upwards of $250,000 per team, 10 teams, to commercialize their game and market the game through esports. 
And they cut that back, I believe, a year or two ago, and they saw less viewership and engagement in their game, and then they continue to spend in it. So it's a marketing vehicle. How do you create engagement in, in micro transactions and game sales? It, you, you create a path to pro. You create a way that you can play and be better than somebody, a way to compete. So they really take a, a funnel of casual gaming into pro gaming. And so that all is done by their own investment into fostering the game. Some, for, like Fortnite and other groups, maybe hit really positive game. They don't need to do that. I personally don't yet consider Fortnite an eSport. And I think that's partially due to the fact of the way that they view their competitions and the sustainability of the ecosystem of it. And I think that there's a lot of things I use to categorize that. But to answer your question, it's about the holistic environment of the game to make to make the marketing vehicle successful. So when you the way that you guys make money, not the event side, kick that out for a second, is publishers of games pay you a subsidy to potentially get a team. Potentially. It depends on the game. Okay. It depends on the game. It depends on where they are. So it's kind of where sponsorships meet games that are more popular. So it depends on if the game developer feels that they have to. So some they just want to put in prize money. They say, I would rather put, like Fortnite, I'd rather put $100 million in prize money, and, not, and that will be my marketing tool. So in, so, in that instance, so you I, only win when you win. Yes. So you'd have to come up with projections and ways to analyze how it's not going to be a total gamble to support a player because you don't get any of the money, effectively. Like, through prize money you do. But that's a gamble. So, so I think that, you know, I would counsel that if... Epic Games were to put, heck, even 20 million of the 100 million they put in price pool and use it to subsidize player salaries, they could have a stronger ecosystem and they could build it and then they could use a different way to commercialize the game. They kind of went through a rush where they're like, okay, we're selling so many in-game item sales, we're making so much money, let's just keep, let's just take out of that, you know, 300 million a month or whatever they're making, let's just take, let's take 100 of it and just put it price pool and it's a good deal. It's low cost for them. They don't have to build the infrastructure. They don't have to put the staff and time. They don't have to work with event partners. It's, it's, it's very lean for them. It's very smart. But I don't, in the long term, I think it may harm them. Once people lose the engagement of your game, and if you don't have a sustainable ecosystem to fall back on, you, you can be in trouble. So I'll, from Counter-Strike, it started in 1999, truthfully. And that game has a significant foundation of infrastructure and partners that, and an open ecosystem that really make it sustainable. And so if the train stops running for Fortnite, then they've got to pick up the phone all of a sudden and call all their partners and say, hey, do you want to do a league? Hey, do you want to, and, and they've, to some degree, they've alienated all of that. And I think that just, I just have a different opinion on whether that leads to success. What games have the highest concentration of professional teams being formed to compete in them right now? Rocket League is one of them. So we had a team go to the World Finals. It's a nice game, very sponsor-friendly um, as they evolve it. And so I just talked a lot of, of strong words against Epic. They own Rocket League. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Epic Games, I love you. No, uh, <laughs> so I, I, I think that you know, if I were Epic Games, what I would do is I would work hard to commercialize the game. I would move, it has a younger fan base. I mean, some of the kids are anywhere from 16 to 18 years old. So it's difficult for them to move that to an all-LAN league because the game level has to mature. So when you think of Smite, some of the players are 24, 26, 30 because the game is a little bit older and more mature. So when you get into a brand new game, even with Fortnite, some of the concern is that like you can't do some of the things. So maybe that's, I'm making an excuse for Epic, but maybe that's one of the reasons is because they're, it's, they have some of the youngest fan base in all of gaming. So maybe it's just part of a life cycle that Epic will wake up to and partner with teams and, and uh, find ways to engage. So I'll just, I'll just speak what I mean to that. We're in the Steelers' offices. We have, if you've ever been to a Steelers game, they've got 60,000 people. I'm a Browns fan. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Been to a qu couple of Steelers games. Well, we, I mean, we can usually turn out great spend a moment to talk about this year. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry that that happened to you. 
being born. You were excited. <laughs> things were happening. It was positive. And then... You're talking about the last 29 years. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you got baited. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> we, as Steelers fans, we feel so sorry for Browns fans. Thank you. That's that's what I want. <laughs> <laughs> My, my favorite picture is of the Browns jersey where the guy goes to the game and he has like 80 back of the name Different tags. quarterbacks. Yeah. yeah, and all the quarterbacks. And so hopefully that doesn't happen with the guy you got now. I think he's pretty good. So I'm hoping so too. So you're in the Pittsburgh office. You are the Pittsburgh Knights. Yes. Talk to me about building a fan base around a team. You guys seem to have taken at least partially a geographic approach. Yeah. Uh, is that standard or is that normal? Um, so I thought about Manchester United when I thought about the Knights, and I thought, how do we take the love of our city global? And so we thought, okay, we'll put it in the name. And I wanted, I want, if you think about it, they're the biggest sports team in the world, basically. I mean, they're one of them. And uh, they do a really good job with the, the city's name, you know, uh, with the region name in the name. So I figured if they can do it, I can do it. And we get a lot of support from the city. I think the city, when they see the team play, a year or so back, 60 million people saw our PUBG team at the World Finals. So that's cool, because Pittsburgh was all over the place. And the city's behind us. They recognize us as an official team of the city. They're so, so uh, super supportive. Are there other teams doing that geographic approach? Overwatch is. And Call of Duty is as a franchise with Activision Blizzard. A couple groups, I think, have done it, but not too many. I think that right now, as fandom grows, people want to stay almost region agnostic to just get every fan. But the way I think about it is, Pittsburgh is a special place. If you look at the group that we have, we're all from Pittsburgh. I would like fans to become fans of us just because if they don't have a team in their region, I mean, if I was from you know, Little Rock, Arkansas, and I had every cool thing in Arkansas happening in my town, I would identify and say, I really like what they're doing. I'm going to be a fan of them. If, if Little Rock ever gets a team, I'll support them too. But I just think uh, hopefully we're setting best in class for what you should do in your region. I want to jump back into revenue models real quick because we're talking about the Steelers and traditional sports make a lot of their money off of the broadcast, right? The broadcast rights. Media rights. Yep. Media rights. And we haven't really touched on those and what that looks like for esports. Is that similar? M remember when I told you where they create the game mm -hmm. and then they start commercializing it, or sorry, they start doing broadcasts and live events, online tournaments or in-person tournaments? It's really when they start commercializing it, if you realize it from a business model, they have to make money. They're doing this to promote themselves. They're investing in it. Mm. And so they're making a sizable investment into generating ROI for their company. And so what they are looking for is co-investors and co-investors that would subsidize teams and all the operations costs and all the marketing costs as a partner. And so what that needs to build and evolve in, and it's starting to, is to memorialize that through a partnership agreement. And some, some leagues do, some leagues don't. They'd like to, transparently, if they don't need to, why are they gonna force to do it? If, if some guy is gonna show up with a VC team in you know, Chicago and just pop up and be like, hello, I'll, I'll be in the game, I'll pay players and salaries and I'll do everything for nothing, maybe I can figure this out to beat the other guy out. So there's a little bit of that. So what I'm, a mission of mine for this year is to understand the associations within North America, the partnerships with the teams, the big teams. I'm a middle tier team, bigger because of my partners. And when I come in, I, I mean, I have the history. I've been in probably longer than the majority of the bigger team owners. So they know me, they know who I am, and I'd like to create value for them and be a servant leader to a larger association where we work collectively for, with game developers. So there's a couple groups. One is called the PEA, and I'm going to be meeting with them to figure out what they're doing. And I want to, uh, there's probably a buy-in to understand you, you make a significant commitment and you come together. And so there's a little bit of fragmentation on this around so many different games and so many teams and franchise and non-franchise. But I think this year for us is about figuring out who are our team partners in a larger league association so that we can help each other. So talk to me about the structure of a team. You have 
an owner and you have players, but in the middle level, are there like a general manager, a EV of player operations? Is there coaches? Like how does, how does the middle of the structure look? So I'll just go over some of the job descriptions that I've got in my head. First, you got partnerships team. So partnerships, and then from that goes activations. So who is managing the partners once you get them? And who's giving re- reports on ROI, event coordinators, you know, who's, who's figuring out where your players are going to go and do meet and greets, et cetera. Also, obviously, player managers, team managers, the whole suite of that, coaches. And then if you extend that, you have... Well, merchandise. So uh, something I went really deep on, I'm very proud of. The Steelers are one of the five teams in the NFL that do their own merch. Uh, Patriots, Packers, Steelers, Cowboys, and Raiders. They buy back some of their license rights from Fanatics and they do their own merchandise. And so we built, with the help of the Steelers, our entire own merchandise line, like, like our whole merchandising company similar to the infrastructure of what the Steelers have and uh, that could do the volume that they have if we had that volume. And so we built that infrastructure to be able to commercialize and monetize our team as we go out there rather than just license our rights away to somebody where we can't see how many are eyes on sales and project and really integrate that and do customization and cool things. So I'm really excited about that. I went backwards. I went deep Mm. on merch, which is probably the last thing that you do as a team and the reason why you do is you have to make sure that you're successful in a lot of other ways i know that i'm going to be successful i've had my i've spent a third of my life in esports and so actually sorry half of my life in (laughs) esports and with that i really wanted to create value for the partners of the association of just going so deep in an area that i knew they hadn't formed yet truthfully with the partners that i get to meet all the steelers clothing vendors and just learn everything about from all their logistics. So I'm proud about that, and we're going to figure that out going forward in 2020. So merchandising was one. Mm-hmm. Um, communications and marketing, graphic and graphic design, content producers, video editors, social media content, social media managers, analytics. Analytics in what context? All social media. Basically partnerships, analytics, and social media. Just basically anything that has numbers attached to it, you need the report reporting. What about like talent recruiting and scouting? Is there anything that's a parallel there? Yeah, we're going to be ramping up on that. I wanted to, before we grew heavy in esports, you have to be able to commercialize and, and support the teams through sponsorships, partnerships, and other revenue sources. So I wanted to get it down pat of understanding the revenue that we would generate per team. So we just spent the last month really breaking down the per team cost of what each team and what revenue it would drive so that we could project the value of sponsors, the value of each team to sponsors, so that we could appropriately create a rate card and, and then have a margin in there for the company. Can you share any of that? Just even no, I can't. in a range? Like no. we, have, we have no idea what that... No, I can't, but uh, that's as far as I'd like to share on that. But no, I just went super deep on basically creating, it's just really, I'm very conscientious on making sure that we create value for our partners and that we don't overspend in the market before we're ready. All these roles you named off, how many full-time employees do you guys have? Uh, we're sitting at 14 right now. Okay. And what, are players like contract employees? What's a player contract look like? Yeah, so they're, they're employees. You can have, depending on what the roles are, independent contractors, employees, it depends on what roles and, you know, if you, if you understand the laws, you have to make sure you're doing the right thing. So it depends on, on how they're engaging with the company. So how many of those 14 are players? Oh, no, there's about, I think we're sitting at about 35 players. Okay, so it's separate. So that's, that's a completely separate group. So I was, I was speaking internal back-end staff. In the industry now. And just, just to be clear, we're going to be hiring a, a good bit more, but at each role, we, we have a lot of resources. And some of the, the awesome thing about how you watch the Steelers do business, they scale. So during game days, they go up to like 1,200 employees. And they sit us significantly lower during until game day. So the, something when you look at an NFL team, their ability to scale with staffing volume is a critical to their business. And so when you think about how small our team is, we are developing and putting in place similar infrastructure as them to be able to scale up on certain things that we need for certain staffing. I think it's that, that's really critical to keeping costs low when you're growing your company. How centralized is purchasing like if someone wants a new 
headset? Or do they just go out and buy it? Or do you guys like bulk purchase? And then not just hardware, but vendors for different types of software and internal communications and all the things that run your business. Is it done at the top or is it decentralized by team and player? So uh, that all goes through our merchandising department. We let them do the purchasing. But I can tell you that with the Steelers, it's awesome to be able to be testing new tech that they might be interested in, new, new services. If it works well for us, the Steelers may consider it. Mm. Figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the uh, good partnership deal. And uh, we'll tell the Steelers if we like it. Yeah. So in some sports, like in baseball, there's no salary cap. And the Yankees just like spend on the best players. And Yeah, I think that system is broken and the reason why baseball has issues. <laughs> so talk to me about the corollary in eSports. Can you just go out and buy the best talent and be the best team on the planet? It, it's, uh, yes. That's why you know some of the teams you know right now through VC and sub like, and they're going through the VC Silicon Valley model growth where they're trying to get a significant amount of views and impressions. And the question is, is that going to drive revenue? Right. And so the, 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 if you look at the internet age back uh, in 2000 when the, crash, when the crash happened, when you focus on, if I was their investor and you told me, oh, I had X amount of YouTube views, or X amount of followers, I would say, great, thanks for the impressions. How is this driving sales, sponsorships, and how are you doing that? And so if it's leaving, leading to revenue and if they're actually attributing to that, great. But when you're sinking significant amount of money into infrastructure, as far as like be it building in a home office, some people are doing it right and they're getting really nice partnerships. I've heard some of them and they're using that to subsidize some of the growth, but it's really, you gotta be careful with that or you can just, spend people's money yeah so what do you think about there are there's like a giant esports stadium being built in texas somewhere right so there's a couple things arlington has an esports arena but i think they might be doing something with envy hastra might be building something for call of duty i have to look into it i know philadelphia and tyler from Comca uh, comcast specter and T1 and uh forget their overwatch team they're building something are you bullish on stadium experiences and plays like that for this industry? I am as long as they're universal, meaning that it's it's not just esports, it's multi-use venues. I think all venues have to be successful. I went into a college, invited me, and they said, hi, we, we're just doing this uh, significant renovation of our basketball arena, and we would like, when the basketball season isn't being used, or volleyball, we'd like to you know, you do esports events in it. And I said, okay, great, can I see the plans? And they showed it to me, and all they did is knock out a wall and make it prettier to let more light in, but it's still a basketball arena. And there was no thought to other alternative uses for wheeling in like projectors or any of the other technology that you would want to transform this thing into a multi-purpose venue to do all kinds of different content and media and shows and events. So. The problem with that is that I think you really need to focus on the programming first and focus on the projected revenue that you would drive from the venue and then work backwards on what it looks like. And I know that's how it's done, but you would see when you see what they make, you would assume they created the design first and said, oh, we'll figure out the programming later. And I just don't get that. Yeah. So I am bullish if the programming is there. And so uh, we'll see. What do most people who are conscious of esports not understand correctly about esports? How big it is. Actually understanding the size and the revenue of the gaming industry versus... So esports is a subsection and the subculture of gaming. And I know you guys know that, but it's important to understand. It's the shiny outer ring of the giant circle of revenue that is gaming revenue. It's what you see and and esports has really been around for a long time, but it's now finding a way to monetize. So it should continue to grow on that giant circle of revenue. When you look at the other ones, they're significantly smaller. If you look at music or TV, it's smaller than gaming revenue. And so I think it's, it's breathtaking to appreciate how big and how powerful a game like uh, a company like Epic Games or, or Valve or Blizzard Activision Blizzard is. They do a great job at driving revenue. And so the thing and the thing that people don't understand is they are the new power players. They created the new football 
and anyone that doesn't create is beholden to them. So you better get in line. Better not say things on podcasts mean about Epic Games. <laughs> Sorry, Epic Games. <laughs> we're, we're getting close to time, so I'll, I'll try to wrap this up. But you've been beating this drum of revenue, driving revenue, metrics, like building a sustainable business. So what does... That, that's to my investors, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Who, who does this really well in the industry and like what levers are they pulling to build a sustainable company in the gaming industry? Who do I think is doing it well? That's a great question. You know, I think Energy with their partnership with Hector and how they're thinking about their business and some of the, the ways that they've been structuring some of what they've been doing with YouTube and their partnerships. I really like, I think they've got a good leadership group over there and I think that they are heavier focused on, focused on that than... I, I think they're doing a good job. I think they're going to do really good for 2020. Uh, it's surprising because you don't hear... You, you know them, but you don't re- they don't really talk about the business side of it. But I like some of the moves they're making. I think that my old company that I used to work for, Liquid, is very smart. Steve Arnsett, Victor Guzins, they are very good at what they do. And they've got really strong backing with the Golden State Warriors Investment Group and Washington Wizards and Axiomatics Capital, which Michael Jordan and all these smart people invested in. They, have, they went through the Disney incubator. I'm super jealous. I think that they're really smart on some of the strategic partnerships that they do. They've got a really good team over there. So I think they're the Yankees of, of esports. And I think I, I model some of what we do off of what they do. I guess my last question is, what's going to change the most in the next five years of esports? I think that there'll be a sustainable ecosystem. I'm going to make a prediction. Oh, we love some good predictions. Okay. I think that the teams will gain significant strength over the next couple years, and the event companies that currently are just partnered with the game developers may become contracted. So it goes game developers... Right now, event companies and then teams. And I think potentially teams may flip with the event organizers where they subcontract to event organizers. Because if you think about it, PRG or all these companies out there that are white label you never hear about, but they just do a ton of events. You don't hear about PRG. You hear about the Steelers or the NFL or, you know, all these other event companies And so I think that right now, event companies are acting as a liaison for marketing. And I think that if the revenue doesn't get distributed appropriately, I think that the teams will gain continually more investment. And then they will will create an infrastructure where they will either build their own event infrastructure. And they will, because they'll partner with sports entities who have that backing and assets, because if you look at Call of Duty, they partner with the Vikings. They partner with sports properties who have that infrastructure. And so I think companies that only do events need to, need teams as much as the teams need the event partners. Awesome. Well, if people want to follow your work or tune in to a Pittsburgh Knights competition, where should they go? Uh, you can go to my Twitter at, at James O'Connor, O-C-O-N-N-O-R, or at Knights.gg. Uh, so Knights.gg is the Twitter handle. Find out more about us, follow us. Uh, I'll start trying to get out there more with content and media once I get out of the bat cave of doing all this finance stuff. <laughs> so, Awesome. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks. Hey, listener. Have you ever wanted to get a message in front of the Upside audience but weren't sure how to sponsor this show or weren't able to do a long-term sponsorship? Well, now you can just go to upside.fm slash classifieds and let our audience know anything that's going on in your world, whether it's an event, an application, a special coupon or deal, or just letting them know who you are, what your company does. All you have to do is go to upside.fm slash classifieds and you can place an ad on this show. That's upside.fm slash classifieds. All right, Jay, we just spoke with James from the Pittsburgh Knights, and he dragged me. <laughs> yeah, he did. Well, he had no, uh, no holds barred, gloves came off, and uh, I love when someone makes you, you know, reflect on this constant self-punishment of following the Browns. Yeah, it's, it's a decision that, you know, I didn't really have a choice, really. I was born into it, but it's one of those things that I just have to 
continue to double down on. And it's one of those things that every time you double down on it, it just somehow gets worse. Feels a lot like blackjack last night at the Mirage. Yeah, I didn't even get a chance to double down. I was just hitting 16s. <laughs> uh, oof. Anyway, hot takes, Eric. What did you think? Holy investor list, huh? Yeah. So one of them is undisclosed, but Wiz Khalifa, I think he mentioned a few off air that we're not going to mention here that are bigger names. And the Pittsburgh Steelers, who we mentioned multiple times, that's quite the investor list, Jay. I can't imagine a better strategic partner than one of the most successful NFL franchises of all time. I mean, I get that esports does not map directly to traditional like NFL football, but they figured so many things out. Even the example he gave of merchandising, that's got to be such a valuable learning. And, you know, having the, the cachet of the sellers behind you to get some friendly terms and deals for whatever software or hardware they may be buying that could be useful to their partners. It seems like James has really figured out a lot of the strategy behind partnerships on the esports side, but it's it sounds necessary because the economics don't just just don't seem as straightforward as you might expect. Yeah, I wish we would have gotten a little bit more on the economics. We understand a little bit more of how they make money, but not the scale or the size or where it really all comes from. And now it's, it's making me question, you know, whether the assumptions of how I think professional sports models generally are as simple as I initially thought. You know, I have no idea what the breakdown is for the Pittsburgh Steelers, for example, of what percentage of their revenue is really coming from what channels and if that's more complex than I think. But the confusing and hard part, it sounds like, is without a consistent model of who the payers are in this industry. You know, some of the game developers are supporting teams themselves. Some of them are just doing these prize packages, which incentivizes teams to come up and build. But to your question of how do you choose what games to get into, it sounds like some complicated algebra and risk, frankly, of where you go. Yeah, as a team owner in esports, it's way different from being a team owner in football, baseball, basketball, lacrosse, whatever it is, because the underlying game isn't going to go away and you can optimize for that game. But being a owner in esports, you're actually more of like a like an investor, right? You're you're making bets on a game, not a not a venture capital investor, but more of maybe a private equity, public markets type investor where you're taking all the all the data you have and making a allocation of capital decision based on game trends and where games are going. And at some point, there's going to be game exits as well, and not the good kind. There's going to be, okay, this game is dying off, so we need to get out of this game yeah. um, and move our resources over to another emerging game. Which frankly sounds difficult as a player, too, if you're trying to be professional in any type of game. If you really wanted to bet and say, like, well, I think that League of Legends is going to continue to be awesome... Well, good luck. You're you're way behind the curve on that, and there's a lot more people competing for that. If you try to get into a younger game, you don't know that that's going to be around, and that's opportunity cost for getting better at some of these other games. So, yeah, it really is interesting that you're building teams around very different games with very different rules and different incentive structures. There's no salary cap, so the liquids of the world can pay all kinds of money for just the best players, and you've got to play Billy Bean Moneyball <laughs> with your gamers. Sounds a lot more complex than I realized. And he, he spoke a few times about big money, big venture getting into this space and funding teams. I didn't get a chance to ask this, but I'm really curious what the expectations on the venture side are if you're putting a ton of money into a team, like where they think the return is going to come from and on what time frame, and what the implications of like, let's say eight more teams that became just heavily venture backed sprung up. What does that mean for the Pittsburgh Knights of the world? Are the Knights going to be good because they have strong fundamentals? Or is that going to kill off some of these more grassroots teams for an artificial bubble of subsidized venture back teams? And if they all fall away, then what? You know? Yeah, I don't have the answer there. One thing I wanted to talk about on this kind of outro is this idea of geography. When we, when we left our conversation with Josh of Convoy Ventures, one of the things that was fascinating, I think, to both of us was this idea that teams didn't have to be geographically centralized. 
they could be, okay, maybe you're not all from Pittsburgh, but instead everyone who follows this team is some other consistent variable. I forget the exact example we gave. But there's a very conscious effort here to mimic what the Steelers and Penguins and Pirates are doing because you guys couldn't see it in the audio, but the Knights gear is black and yellow. So it harkens back to the city of Pittsburgh being black and yellow and I think makes it easier for generations that aren't used to this esports experience to get on board and root for their city, but I don't know at what cost. Yeah, I don't know what at what cost either. You know, if I'm really into Rocket League and I want to follow a professional team, but I live in Denver, am I going to follow the Pittsburgh Knights if Denver doesn't have a team? Or am I going to find somewhere that doesn't have a geographical allegiance? On the other side of the coin, there seems to be a lot of value at a high-level partnership perspective for being aligned with the city because the city support themselves, they're recognized as an official professional team in the city of Pittsburgh. That probably was very fundamental to partnering with the Steelers, frankly, I would guess. So I think there's a lot of value there. But yeah, the question of to what cost is really interesting. And if the cost is viewership and fandom, what does that mean? Are you lowering revenue on merchandise or on ticket sales? Or is the majority of your revenue coming elsewhere so it doesn't matter? Can you exist with a smaller fan base in esports and still have a more profitable team if you understand the the economics of where your biggest revenue generators are? I don't know. Maybe a part two coming up. Yeah, it sounds like we have a lot of things we should have asked, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, you spent 10 minutes talking about the Browns. That's on me. You know, I <laughs> you get me started on the brownies and I'll just fold. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, we'd love to hear your perspective on this. Any other questions we should have asked and didn't? tweet at us at Upside FM or email us hello at Upside.fm. If there's another team or another aspect of professional gaming you'd like to hear about, tweet at us at Upside FM. Otherwise, we'll talk to you next week. That's all for this week. Thanks for listening. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's guest. So shoot us an email at hello at Upside.fm or find us on Twitter at Upside FM. We'll be back here next week at the same time talking to another founder in our quest to find upside outside of Silicon Valley. If you or someone you know would make a good guest for our show, please email us or find us on Twitter and let us know. And if you love our show, please leave us a review on iTunes. That goes a long way in helping us spread the word and continue to help bring high quality guests to the show. Eric and I decided there were a couple things we wanted to share with you at the end of the podcast. And so here we go. Eric Hornung and Jay Klaus are the founding parties of the Upside Podcast. At the time of this recording, we do not own equity or other financial interest in the companies which appear on this show. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinions of Duff and Phelps LLC and its affiliates, Unreal Collective LLC and its affiliates, or any entity which employ us. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. We have not considered your specific financial situation nor provided any investment advice on this show. Thanks for listening and we'll talk to you next week.